Hi, everybody, and welcome to Serverless Office Hours. So my name is James Bezik. I'm a developer advocate in the AWS Serverless team. And today I'm joined by two guests. We've got Ryan Backman and Doug Klassen. How are you doing? Doing well. How about you? Not too bad. So today we're going to be talking about Code Catalyst. We've got lots of different topics to cover. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Doug, because I think you're starting with some information about the service and how it works. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Well, hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Doug Clausen. Uh, I am a product manager here with Code Catalyst. I'm going to walk you through just a few upfront slides just so we all can level set about what Code Catalyst is, why we did it, uh, and then I'll kick it over to Ryan for a demo and, and we'll take your questions. So um, I'm going to jump right in. So before we too, dive too deeply into uh, Code Catalyst itself, I wanted to sort of take a step back and look at the different set of uh, dev tools that we offer here at AWS. You know, we offer tools that go to, all the way from authoring, um, source control, build and test, uh, deployments, and then monitoring your particular solutions. Uh, the team that I'm on more specifically focuses on that um, middle of the chain there. So sort of from source artifact through deployments with code commit, code artifact, code build, code deploy, and code pipeline. Uh, and prior to releasing Code Catalyst, our focus here was on releasing or, or having available a set of building blocks that customers would take and then build a, and ultimately build their software development lifecycle and how they wanted to do it, right? So these tools offered a lot of flexibility and, and sort of met the customer where they were. But at the same time, um, with the set of tools, we continually heard about <clears throat> sort of, I'll say three themes around problems customers continued to have. So problems around setting up projects and integrating tools. So, you know, if you think about building your own custom solution, let's say I wanted to use, you know, Jira for my issues and uh, uh, code commit for my source control and maybe Jenkins for my CI CD pipelines. Um, I have to then build a custom integration on each side of that, right? So maybe Jira to code commit and code commit then to Jenkins. And then not only do I have to build it, but I actually have to maintain it too, right? So I'm sort of increasing my code base um, and I'm not actually delivering anything for the customer with that increase of the code base, right? It's just helping me do my job. So setting up projects was hard and then also integrating the tools. Um, so understanding which sets of services to use, uh, you know, as AWS has grown in services, uh, it's become more complex. Uh, I usually use the well-architected sites to understand what that looks like. Um, but, but it continues to be a problem, right? And we saw customers struggling with this. The second big area was around automating the automation. So automating CI CD pipelines and automating environments. So uh, we saw customers essentially struggling to adopt best practices around, especially continuous delivery. Um, and it was mostly because they weren't, they, they, they needed help automating that automation as they were getting their project set up and sort of taking the best practice from the start. And then the last thing is just around the complexity of modern apps. So we continued to see uh, customers, uh, you know, modern applications are highly distributed, uh, different architectures, different languages, right? And we continue to see customers struggle with which set of, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but which set of services do they pick and use and, and why? And um, how do you sort of build and test in that highly distributed environment? And so with that, we took a step back and we thought about what should we do? And we ultimately decided to release Code Catalyst. So think of Code Catalyst as a complete from idea to production system. Uh, so it's pre-integrated all of the particular pieces of the software development lifecycle uh, so that you don't have to do it yourself, right? You can pick it up and have a first deployment of your project in just a couple of minutes. I think Ryan will show this today in a demo. So it's from project management and issues management solution that we have um, all the way through your source control to build, test, and then ultimately deploying that application into production or another environment that you wanted to deploy to. The other thing with Code Catalyst is we knew we wanted to ensure that we sort of met customers where they were. So if there was a particular piece of that tool chain that you loved, uh, or you were highly invested in, let's say it's Jira, you know, you just couldn't get away from Jira and you loved it and you wanted to continue using Jira. Um, we wanted to ensure that we would support that as well. Um, so extensibility was a big piece of this. So if you didn't want to use our first party Jira or our first party issues management solution, uh, we actually partnered with Atlassian and we have a Jira integration that you could sort of completely forego our first party solution and just insert your Jira issues as your issues management solution. Uh, and I got one more slide. Um, there was four real, four key things that we really focused on with Code Catalyst to try to solve. And it all goes back to the issues I talked about at the very beginning. Um, this is the solutions, right? So we want to do accelerate project setup. You'll see that today. Um, 
more specifically for uh, what we call project blueprints. So think of a blueprint as a template that gets you everything you need to get started and make sure you're getting started on the right foot, right? So you can have a, a you know, a service serverless image handler or a single page application stood up in, you know, just literally a few seconds with a few clicks. Comes with everything you'd need, issues management board, source control, CICD pipelines, and then ultimately, um, you know, the environment setups as well. Second big piece was automating that automation. So with those blueprints comes, like I mentioned, CICD pipelines as well as environments, uh, the next two things. And then the last thing was, uh, how do we ensure that, that customers can collaborate and how do we ensure that, you know, it's not only can you get started quickly, but you can easily collaborate and have a tool that will scale with your team as well. Um, and so we have a, a pretty fluid system into how you get invited to a project. Um, the authentication is done outside of an AWS account. And so you'll have a, what we call a builder ID. That builder ID is your personal identity on AWS. Uh, and so you can really get started on a, uh, with just an email or password. That was a quick five minute fire hose. Um, any questions, James? Or should we jump into a demo? Uh, nothing so far, but for everybody watching, we've got a, a principal PMT here from the team and also a specialist SA. So if you have any questions about these services whatsoever, put them in the chat and we'll answer them in between. But yeah, let's, let's jump into a demo. Cool. Awesome. Thanks, Doug. Um, all right, so it's, it's demo time. I'm sure this is everyone's favorite. And uh, like Doug said, thank you for your interest in uh, attending today and uh, listening to us speak uh, on Code Catalyst. So the first thing, and this is the landing page or the marketing page of Code Catalyst. And I'm gonna walk through this, this demo um, as a developer, um, specifically as you know a developer that needs to build a serverless application. Uh, the first thing that I want to call out here from this marketing page is you're going to land on Code Catalyst outside of your AWS console. This is an off console product. Um, and so there's really no direct affiliation um, necessarily with any specific AWS account. You won't find this in the console. It is Code Catalyst at AWS. Um, and so I will go ahead and sign, sign in. The other thing, um, as this, this sign in page loads, um, the other thing you'll notice here is we're asking for this AWS Builder ID. Um, because this is an uh, off console product, uh, we needed a new method to authenticate and authorize individuals to use this product. Um, and that is what we're calling the Builder ID. If you think of kind of the attribution that comes with IAM users or resources, it, it doesn't really fit a model of a builder or developer and the things that you may want to track and how how the mobility of developers can move from projects to organizations to spaces. Um, and so that's that's kind of why we built the AWS Builder ID. And you also start seeing AWS Builder ID um, pop up in, in a couple other tools. Um, you know, we were the first one at Code Catalyst, but you know, the Builder ID is starting to integrate more and more um, with various services um, and spaces in AWS. Um, and, and right now to get started, uh, all you need is an email address to sign up and create a builder ID. So you can see here that I have that already pre-populated, put in my password. So the first place that I am going to land when I authenticate into Code Catalyst um, is called a Code Catalyst space. You can think of a space really as just a high level construct within Code Catalyst to help you organize uh, certain settings, properties um, for your organization or um, you know, whatever that top level constructs. If you, if you have a small team, if you're an individual, if you're part of a wider organization that has a space, just think of a space as a way to organize um, various entities and projects underneath uh, that construct. Uh, specifically, I'm, just, I'm not gonna go through everything um, but I do actually, let me switch and, and you can belong to multiple spaces, right? So uh, I'm logged in with my personal builder ID. Um, and you can see, I have a list of multiple spaces where I now can collaborate with other organizations, other, other teams, um, start talking about the collaboration aspect of this. Uh, I'm going to go into this space. And so some of the things that you can configure at the space level. Um, our, our, our stuff like, um, you know, billing and we have this marketplace of extensions and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about them. Um, but the one thing I do want to call out here is this is where you also link your AWS account. So when you first sign up, um, you do need an AWS account to link to your space. Um, and I can kind of see the, the accounts that are linked to this space. So you need at least one when you initially sign up. 
Um, but when you start thinking of building applications or you know workloads in a production setting, you're going to have multiple accounts traditionally. Um, you might have dev test stage. You might have you know service specific accounts. Um, so by the ability of linking all these accounts at the space level, you now have access to um, deploy your workloads in in you know complex strategies, right? So you can have this like, promotion process. If I had a concept of dev, dev test stage, um, you know, I might have service specific. This is where you link your accounts, and and by linking multiple, um, you now have the ability to kind of do uh, application promotion. Uh, uh, I am going to switch now to another space. So I have a question for you, Ryan, yeah. just very quickly there. If you have an organization ID, we've got multiple accounts. Do you then recommend that you have one builder ID? How you know? How would you map a builder ID to an organization to accounts? Yeah. So right now, builder ID is completely separate from. I mean, builder ID is the identity of the actual developer, right? And so that's just an email address. There, I think work is being done, and, and builder IDs are separate from, um, you know, IAM principles that maybe exist in your AWS account. So when you link when you link accounts right now, um, one of the things that you do do is when you link an account, you also have to create an IAM role um, for that space, uh, and I can show that a little bit later in the demo where you can now scope what Code Catalyst can do. Um, within your account um, by creating these IAM roles and then linking those IAM roles to those various environments. So it's not really passed on to the builder ID yet. Um, we'll have groups in our back later this year um, to help kind of control some of that. Um, but right now it is that account link with an IAM role assigned to that target account. Okay. Um, all right, so now uh, I'm in a space, I've got no projects. Uh, I wanna build something, I'm a developer. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and create a project. Um, there's multiple, and, and whatever a project is, right? I, I you know, I, I think of a project as a service or, a, you know, any type of application that you want to, I think, manage um, independently of everything else, right? So it can be a microservice, it can be a monolith. Uh, it's up to you to define what the shape of a project is. Uh, but we have multiple ways of creating these projects. Um, so you can start from scratch. Um, you can bring your own code. So if you already have code available and you want to leverage the capabilities of Code Catalyst, such as like project management or um, you know the, the the test reports, um, you can go ahead and import or link that code um, into a project. Uh, but what we're going to do here is start with a blueprint. Now Doug mentioned this a little bit. Uh, these blueprints are project templates, but they're more than just like static templates. Um, they really are kind of a paved road. Um, to create all types of different architectures and use cases, right? So we're we're serverless um, here, and so you know you can start seeing some of some of the blueprints that we have in here um, to help enable certain serverless architectures, right? Um, and I know we mentioned single application, but we have this serverless RESTful microservice. Um, we have this you know building a modern three tier application. If I go into here real quick. Um, within our blueprints, um, we have the ability to have options or configurability of these blueprints. So if I, if I want to build this, um, you know, for instance, this modern three tier web application that is an API gateway, a, uh, a logic layer with compute, and then your data tier, um, with DynamoDB, our blueprints also want to present the use case, but not necessarily dictate the architecture in some cases, right? And so this one, you can choose between Lambda or a containerized workload. And, and based on this decision, this is going to synthesize all the code required to either run in Lambda or run in Fargate, right? Um, and so those are some of the, the powers of these blueprints. I am going to actually deploy a different blueprint though. And I am going to deploy a SAM application. So simple SAM API. We're going to use the SAM framework um, to to build and deploy. And so I'm just going to go here, select that. Um, all our blueprints come with these nice little readmes. Um, gives you uh, the permissions you need um, to configure in your account um, to to be able to successfully deploy these projects. Uh, and anything other useful information on like how to take this project um, and, and extend it or develop and make it at your own. Just like before, we have a uh, let's see, serverless demo. Give it a project name. 
so these are all referencing those account connections that I showed earlier when I was in my space. Um, because this is going to deploy an actual application or workload, uh, we do need to uh, assign it an account connection. Uh, this space only has one, so it's going to default to that. And then the various roles um, that I need, right? And all, all this information on like what permissions I need um, could have been found in my README. Uh, these roles already existed in this particular space, so I'm just going to go ahead and select those. Um, and then just like the other one, when I talked about configurability here, right? We have a SAM app, um, but we also want to provide uh, the options to the builder or the consumer of these blueprints, the ability to pick a language um, that is most familiar with them. Uh, I, I, I hate Java. I don't mind Node, um, but I think of these four, I, um, I think I default on Python. So I'm going to select Python for this demo. Uh, and then be, Ryan, um, just on that, since you, we saw you selected Sam earlier, but one of the questions from the audience is, that they, do they assume it uses CloudFormation? It does, yeah. So the, the Sam build process will, yeah. So there, there is a CloudFormation for the deployment orchestrator um, here. That's a good question. Yep. Okay. And then just expanding, right? Um, and the, the author of these blueprints, um, and I'll take it this. So right now we have, I think it looks like we have like 20 blueprints in the product today across a whole bunch of different use cases, right? Some of from our solutions library, some are more primitive, uh, you know, just simple API. Um, but these are all built um, by AWS experts and subject matter experts uh, when we build these blueprints. And they all include stuff like CI CD pipelines, starter, hello world code, um, even like unit and integration tests, depending on how complex the use case is or how, um, how complex the application that is bundled with these blueprints are, right? Uh, and so some of these also have some level of additional configurability um, that kind of just changes some of the behavior once I create this project. So let me go ahead and create this project. And if you're just joining us today, we're talking about Code Catalyst. So we've got uh, Doug, who's a, a principal PMT with Amazon, and Ryan, who's a specialist SA, and he's showing us how to use this. But put any of your questions in the comments, and we'll get to those as we go through the demo. Awesome. All right, so now I have my project. Um, on the left-hand nav menu here, you can start seeing some of the capabilities that I would need to manage this project or, or manage my SDLC just in general, um, right? Starting with, with issues, um, if you don't have, like if you want to project management this, uh, this particular project where you want to create issues or a place to store um, maybe your bug reports or your user stories, um, we have included a, uh, a relatively flexible um, yet simple um, kind of issue management um, capability within Code Catalyst. The other thing I'll call out here too that I that I won't show in the demo is we also have the ability to to extend this capability to Jira, right? So uh, over time, Code Catalyst will be a very extensible platform um, that kind of is going to unify that experience. And so if you don't want to use this uh, issue tracking within a project, uh, you do have the ability to kind of jump into your catalog. Um, and if you are using Jira, you can install and configure this extension. And now that issue tracking for this project um, will be served by Jira. The developer can live in Code Catalyst, can interact with those uh, that data that is sourced from Jira. Doesn't necessarily have to go in Jira, can understand their daily work um, and, and just, uh, use Jira as that source of data rather than the first party capability. Yeah, I think Ryan, that's just an important thing to stress too. Um, we realize, again, and Ryan's gonna show you that project creation created everything for him, right? So he's got this whole project up and running, but we also realize that it's a, it's important that some customers are gonna want to keep what they had. So he showed the two that we had, GitHub source and Jira for issues. Uh, we have a bunch more of those in the pipeline right now. Um, we should have a few more source providers by the end of the year. Um, potentially even a tad bit earlier than that. Um, and so you'll continue to see those expand. So like, if you don't see the one you have today there, one, tell us about it. We'd love to hear about it. You see that little give feedback button down the lower left. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and then two, uh, there's more coming. So uh, if you have a particular piece that you're like, man, I really want to keep this piece of my SDLC, let us know. We'd love to hear from you and, and uh, prioritize that in. So yeah. sorry, Ryan, go ahead. No, that's awesome, thanks. All right, so I am, uh, right, again, I'm a developer, I'm a server, I, I really just wanna build something. Uh, these issues are nice, um, but let's go ahead and start uh, looking at our code um, and, and making some changes. 
Um, so like Doug mentioned, right, when I created this project, I got a lot more, right? I, I, I saw the issues. Um, I also got a source repo um, with all my code, and this is all my starter code. Um, for this project. So you can start seeing, you know, we have a, a template file for Sam. Uh, we have a, a function with events uh, and a function. We have, um, yeah, our template file that kind of defines the API gateway and uh, the resource. And so all this is kind of kind of boilerplate getting started. Hello world stuff um, to, to build a Sam application. Well, let's say I want to I want to change this or I interact with it or at least dive in a little bit more from a code perspective. So as a developer, um, I need some kind of IDE. And so within Code Catalyst, we have these dev environments. So dev environments are um, ephemeral, on-demand, containerized, remote development environments um, that I can use to quickly spin up an IDE and interact with the, my source repo for this project. Right. So I can go ahead and create this dev environment. Um, if you're familiar with Cloud9, Cloud9 is a uh, browser-based ID that AWS supports. But our dev environments and Code Catalysts, we also want to make sure that we provide, right? Like, we are religious. Developers are religious about, um, you know, the IDE that we're going to use. And so rather than saying, hey, we're only going to support Cloud9, we have an option. Uh, and hopefully, one of these IDs that you can kind of see on my screen um, is something that you like, and we'll continue probably to add more in the space as well. Uh, so for this first portion, I am actually going to use Cloud9. And I um, and, and there's this workflow about cloning and branching, uh, but I just want to get in and start interacting with uh, some of my code. So I'm just going to go ahead and create off of the main branch. And if you think about being a developer on this particular project, and not having a dev environment, what you're going to have to do is get your local environment set up so that you can then run this particular application and or build this particular application, right? And so what dev, what a dev environment is essentially doing is, is taking care of that heavy lifting for you, right? It's going to create a back-end machine in the cloud, which is going to do all that heavy lifting. And then as you can see, his Cloud9 uh, browser has popped up here. Um, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> one question. Integrated <laughs> development environment. Did you mean Vim? <laughs> hey, yeah. I mean, yep. A lot of people still do. Uh, awesome. Uh, and I, I was a big Atom user. I'm so sad to see Atom go away. But I guess we have VS Code. Yeah, I was a big Vim user. Uh, <laughs> except for the very first time, you know, you use some of these uh, things. You're like, how the heck do I get out of this thing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was no easy close button. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So I spun this up, right? I'm, I'm now at the command line. I'm not going to do too much with the code here. I'm actually going to spin up another ID uh, as part of the demo to show uh, some other features or capabilities. Um, but I do want to, you know, I came in here for a particular reason. And the fact that if I go in here, um, you'll see that the, the utilities I need for this particular blueprint are already part of my development environment. Um, and how that works is if I go in here and expand, we use dev files as a way to model the dependencies or the experience for a development environment for this particular project. So whenever I created this project, um, each, each project um, that creates these applications will come with a, a dev file. And you'll see here that there's some kind of commands in here. Um, this dev file, again, it models this development environment experience. So as you look to create this project um, and you look to collaborate with other developers, you know, setting up the IDE, it's normally like, hey, go to this wiki or I'm going to email you a, a list of 20 steps that I did to set up this particular IDE for this particular project. And then you have to context switch between different projects with different builds. It, it, it is a pain. And so with this dev file, this dev file um, allows projects administrators or owners the ability to define everything that a development environment or developer needs to develop on this particular um, project, right? And, and so you can kind of see here that it's executing um, a, a few commands to, to set up the environment uh, on each time. So now I can do my changes. I can have another developer come in here. They can spit up their own dev environment, and they're going to have a consistent experience each time. Brian, could you zoom in just a little bit? It's a bit small on the... Yeah, screen. let me see if I... Let's see. Like that. 
and this is a simple use case, right? Um, but um, yeah, and this is also a, a public spec. So there's devfile.io. If you're uh, devfile.io, if you're interested in this spec or how this is used, this is an open source project that uses dev files. Um, AWS is not the only kind of consumer of these dev files um, as well. All right. Um, all right, so let's actually change something. So to change something, uh, we're going to get fancy. I'm going to go ahead and blow this environment away, or I'll, maybe I'll just leave it. I'm actually going to create a new dev environment. This time I'm going to create a branch, and I am going to use VS Code. And so now I'm going to go ahead and work in a new branch, and I'll call it feature123. We'll branch for main, and we will create. I think VS Code. Yep. So now that I'm using VS Code, this is going to trigger um, basically an automated workflow local. I need VS Code installed as a prerequisite. I also need the AWS Toolkit um, installed in VS Code. Uh, but considering that I have those two in place, um, this browser will guide and automatically set up the remote connection for me automatically. So it's, I don't have to worry about credentials, authentication. All of that is passed in through Code Catalyst, um, and this is just going to do some magic behind the scenes. Uh, and eventually, I will have um, a dev environment um, using a remote connection in VS Code. And here you can see the same files. And if I open up a new terminal, um, you'll be able to see. Uh, no. um, that I am in in my branch so all that was taken care of for me automatically and my credentials are set up you know everything is cloned i don't have to worry about any of that uh so to change the code let's actually update some code and this is another integration in code catalyst um, i'm going to introduce a new service it's called code whisper um, for those that are not familiar with code whisper um, code whisper is a, a coding companion uh, uses generative ai um, that reads in context from your working file and human language, right? So you can uh, comment your code or, or um, put code comments for like prompting. Um, and then Code Whisper understands that natural language um, and then tries to generate, um, you know, valid code against, uh, against that context. Uh, so I will go ahead and enable that. And this is this is free. Like Code Whisper is free. Uh, there is a free tier with Code Whisper. Um, all you need is your builder ID, which is there's also a free tier for Code Catalyst in that sense. Um, so I can go in here and just uh, initialize. It's gonna it's gonna prompt me through an authorization workflow. So I want to yes, I want to use my builder ID. It's going to open up a browser just to say, hey, do you want to allow this? Click, click, click. The browser um, window opened on a different screen, so you won't actually be able to see that. But once I hit allow, um, I will now be able to use Code Whisper um, to generate some code. And if I remember right, the allow, you're basically just allowing access to your code base to Code Whisper on that allow screen, right? Right, right, right. So it, it needs to understand. Now it's not going to read all the files, but it does need context in terms of like, what is the file name? Is it a Python file? Um, all of that provides context to the uh, AI model to make a determination on like what the output should be. Um, OK, so let's go ahead and open up my file. Let's find our uh, hello world function. Um, if, if we looked at the original, right, this was hello world. Um, so, it, and this is probably deployed. So if I go ahead and figure out what's my invoke URL, um, I probably can call that invoke URL and I should get this, uh, body back. This is hello world, but we don't want to do that. Let's get rid of all this code. Um, and let's say we want a function, um, that returns, um, I don't know, the current date and time in a specific format, right? So I can write a, a plain text English uh, language. So I can say, right, like create a, and the more uh, context you give it, 
um, the better the results are going to be, right? So this is like a generic one. And it'll start making suggestions. So you can kind of see this green, this gray start saying, hey, maybe you want to do this. But I want to create a Lambda function that returns the current date in, um, oh man, in the format to API gateway, right? So I want a Lambda, or let me make sure it's a Lambda function that returns. So all I'm going to do is like create this Lambda function um, that returns this current date. Um, I specify a format and then I want to give it more additional context. I want to return it to API gateway because this is a, uh, right, it's using the proxy integration between API gateway and my uh, my Lambda function. So that's all I'm going to do. And let's see what it comes comes up. And I will say, because this is generative AI, um, right, like this is non-deterministic, right? It's going to do its best to uh, understand that language and come up with a result. And now it's starting to make suggestions to me. So you can see here that I'm doing, um, it's suggesting to create my Lambda handler definition. So I will accept that. And as I return and enter new lines, um, you can see it starts to make more suggestions. And so you can see what it suggested ne next. It's actually going to return a response that the API gateway expects and needs um, to properly handle that Lambda integration, um, as well as it's using the import that I imported earlier. Um, and it's going to straight, and then it's going to produce the actual um, format that I had here defined in plain text. Um, yep, and so I'm happy with that. So let's go ahead and save that. And now I can go ahead and just find my terminal. So what are you finding are the really good use cases for code whisperers? Is it just really good for, you know, things that are kind of boring to write, like putting things in tables or moving data along, or is it capable of things that are, you know, more elaborate? What have you found? Yeah, I, I will say um, new, new APIs or new services. I mean, for me, um, it, it, our API, AWS's APIs, um, it, it is a first class citizen and it does more than just AWS stuff. Um, yeah. I, I do want to make clear, but like if you're just learning a new service or, or even if you're just coming to a new architecture or just starting to use some of our SDKs um, and to be fair, some of our documentation for some of our SDKs or our services aren't, aren't the greatest. But if I, if I am just starting to use some of these new APIs or services in AWS, like code whisper, really has a lot of great examples on just some of that boilerplate code to help you get started with some of these integrations and consuming some of uh, AWS services. Mm. Um, I, I will say, right, and this is, you know, maybe if you're already familiar, right, like, for instance, this land, I've written a thousand Lambda functions by now, I probably wouldn't use Code Whisper because I'm very familiar with. So I think it's more, um, Right. Maybe you're stepping into a new framework. Maybe you're stepping into a new language. Maybe you're stepping into a new ecosystem. Uh, I think Code Whisper is a great coding companion in that sense. If, mm -hmm. if you have deep knowledge on what you're writing, um, it may be a little bit too chatty. Right. Yeah. So that's an interesting point. So, you know, for some of the runtimes, such as Go and Rust, are popular with the community, but there are fewer examples of. Is that the sort of a thing this could help you with if you need to do, you know, inserts into tables or returning back to API gateway and this sort of thing where you need to know the precise syntax. Yeah, 100%, absolutely. And I, you know, like, uh, I mean, I'll give you an example. Personal, I um, I just started started with TypeScript. I know TypeScript is uh, all the rage now. And, and some of the things that I've built in Code Catalyst um, are geared towards TypeScript. Mm -hmm. um, and so I use Code Whisperer. To, to help me kind of get started and learn the various idioms um, and syntax uh, until I got a good grasp of it, mm. um, where I, I now can you know do most stuff. So great. Um, all right, so I pushed my code. Let's jump back. How are we doing on time? All right, let's... we're good. We've got okay. twenty six minutes. Awesome. Um, so here I'm going to go in, and now I push my code right, and I am going to. Go ahead and create a pull request. 
um, I'll be able to find my feature and then I want to merge it into main uh, daytime. And I could go right just like any other kind of code review tool that you may be familiar with. Um, it's going to show us a diff within the code review process. You can do inline comments. You can do overall comments. You can, I think, add emojis, um, limited emojis. Uh, but let's go ahead and merge this. And behind the scenes, and I haven't even gotten to this part yet, um, and I will merge it. Um, behind the scenes, when I'm merging this or when I created this project initially, let's jump into our CI CD workflows. All of this is being automated and deploying um, to our environment. Right. So our one of the things that we talked about is automated the automation. People wanting to know best practices. Of how do we deploy these type of uh, workloads? How do you know what's the best way to do this? Um, well, we we had like well architected best practices in mind when we started creating some of these CI CD pipelines that are included in these blueprints. Um, so here you can kind of see that we have a pretty simple build and release that is two step process. Um, we have our source. It's going to build the artifacts um, and then it's going to deploy using cloud formation. If I go into um, the previous one, you can kind of see here that there's an audit trail um, or log output of all the things that it did. So if, if, if there is an error, if something did go wrong, or if you're just curious um, in all the actions that happen within the workflow, you can kind of go into a, a specific run, go into the action, um, and then identify the area that you want to investigate. Uh, likewise, there is um, a variable section that can be used for inputs or outputs in the workflow. Um, here, since this was our first deployment, um, our, our current merge to main is now building, but we had the existing one when we created the project. Um, here we have that invoke URL um, that should return hello world. So if I go here and Go here, I should see uh, Hello World JSON, uh, which is it. Uh, the other thing I want to call about uh, in terms of these workflows, these workflows are really uh, intended to get you started. Um, they aren't, you know, the only way to do things. Um, and so you can edit these workflows too. So if I go in here and I want to edit and, and things that you might want to do, right? Like we're just building an artifact and then deploying that artifact, but you might want to do security testing. You might want to do, um, you know, multiple environments. You, you know, you might want to do pen, pen testing. You know, wh whatever you want to do in a workflow or you want to invoke, you can extend these definitions um, to whatever you see fit. Uh, we support both YAML, so a, a simplified YAML definition to define your workflow, um, as well as a visual editor if you're a, a visual person. Um, to see the available actions that we have today, um, we have a catalog of first party actions um, built by, you know, the Code Catalyst team, as well as some partners with other um, service teams within AWS. Um, and you'll have things like deploying ECS. Um, you'll see one here uh, to invoke a Lambda. Uh, if I go to page two, there's an action for actually using SAM to deploy. Um, and we continually to make investment and add other actions in the space. Uh, additionally, um, we also support GitHub Actions, right? So if you're if you're using GitHub or GitHub Actions or even some of the integrations, like you know, if you're using the serverless framework or something like that, and there's an action to use SLS um, to actually deploy code, and there's a GitHub action for that, and it's not in our first party catalog, um, you can go ahead and. Uh, run those same actions within the context of Code Catalyst and a Code Catalyst workflow. Yeah, and we've configured, we pre-configured multiple of those on the GitHub action side. And think of that little plus button down there as sort of a, the boilerplate code to allow you to add that to your particular workflow, right? So, yeah. um, you know, it's adding boilerplate YAML that then he could configure either in the editor there or could go then to the YAML editor and edit it as well right there. So. And let's go back to our workflow to check on, and we should see a failure. Yep, good. Uh, so let's go in and see what failed here. 
All right, so if we go in here and oh, it ran some tests. So let's expand that. Um, and it looks like we had a unit test failure. So the other thing that we have in Code Catalyst is a report section. So we can kind of go into our reports. Um, we see that we have a failed result in the report. So we can kind of go into this report. Um, and it will show us that we had a unit test that was looking for, remember, we, we had that old JSON body that had a message key and it said, hello world. Um, so it looked like we had some unit tests uh, around that. Um, and so as you're developing this, and I, I show this for a couple of reasons. One is, hey, we now have a place that we're reporting on your tests. Um, so if you are writing your unit test and your um, integration test, um, there is a, a place within Code Catalyst um, to quickly access this information. Um, and report and, and track trends over time. Uh, but the other thing is, again, with our blueprints and the projects that uh, you can create from, you know, we really keep in mind best practices, right? And so there were, you know, unit tests and integration tests that were a part of it. Um, now, because we changed the function, we broke the unit tests. So let's quickly go back. Um, and you can see that the result, right? This is what we asked for. This is what we got. Um, but it was looking for um, a message key. So let's go ahead and update our unit test um, with the correct new format. Um, so we can go in here and where's my test? Test unit. Oh, test handler. And we can go all the way down to our assertions and it's asserting, hey, we're getting a status code. Well, that didn't change. Uh, we no longer have a message key and the message key doesn't say hello world. So we can just uh, update, or we can delete it and assert true, but let's just say uh, assert that our type data, and you can see that Code Whisper is still trying to give me, well, that might be uh, IntelliSense type. And then we'll just say, hey, we're expecting a string value from our data. So let's, oh, you know, I got to change back to, Check out learning. All right. So now if I go back into my CI CD pipeline, I should see a, another invocation and that's running. Uh, and we'll 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 wait for this to complete. Um, so just uh, and I I know we're we're coming up kind of on time, and hopefully we have some questions. Uh, the other thing I'll show you here is the the environment section, right? So all these changes we're only deploying to this default environment, and this default environment was named um, based on you know input or parameters when we created the project. I, th I think there was a field that allow us to you know whatever the name is, um, but this this environment that we create in Code Catalyst for this project is linked to uh, an AWS account, right? So you can think of it as an alias um, or some kind of label on top of uh, an account. But uh, this also allows us to track changes to our environments. Um, so this is a pretty simple use case because we only have one environment and we've only had kind of one successful deployment activity. But you can imagine an environment where you have multiple environments from developer, uh, develop environment to to test to UAT to production or you, you know alpha gamma you know however whatever nomenclature you use to define um, your multiple environments um, you have the ability to model those um, in a project environments and as you deploy to these various environments you now have the ability to tr track um, the changes the status uh, what triggered that change uh, what workflow brought that change um, and so this is kind of a, a, a nice feature in allowing teams or developers to kind of see from a single place, you know, what the current state of my environments are. Mm. Uh, is there, was there a question? Yeah, yeah. So, well, that's a great demo, Ryan. Thanks very much for giving us a walkthrough of that. So yeah. uh, here's one of the questions. Can you import SAM template files? Let's say I build and export my SAM template using App Composer. Would it be possible to add it here and build a workflow around it? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, and some of those use cases, you know, you might start from scratch. There's no direct integration between like App Composer now and the artifact that that produces. However, you can start there and take that artifact um, and then, you know, create a project from scratch. Um, if you recall, like going back to how we created, you can create a project from scratch, you can create a repo um, and then, you know, check that, check that template file into that repo. Um, and, and that's a great way to get started. Yep. And, and, and yeah, like just about anything you can do or you may have built or any framework that you might have used, um, if there's a will, there's a way to actually implement that in Code Catalyst. Because at the end of the day, this is Git repos and a compute environment that executes, you know, arbitrary commands or actions on your behalf. Yeah. So uh, what is the difference between Code Catalyst and Code Pipelines? I'm sure uh, you get this question a lot. Yeah, so, uh, and I think it's, um, you know, you know, I think the raising it up a little, what's the difference between Code Catalyst and some of our code suite services? Um, so not just Code Pipeline, um, but like Code Build and Code Commit. If I look at those services, like the Code Build, Code Pipeline, um, they were really focused on bespoke capabilities within a certain pillar of the SDLC, right? So code pipeline is an orchestration engine, uh, a workflow engine to help you automate, um, you know, from source to deployment. Um, and it's just focused on that one thing, right? But the SDLC or managing application is a lot more than that. So code catalyst is kind of that full end to end SDLC platform um, where you can do, right? I showed you dev environments. Um, there's obviously workflows in here. Um, but there's a lot more than just that workflow engine. Uh, under the covers, though, um, a lot of the capabilities that Code Catalyst is abstracting away from that, some of the complexity of like workflow management and stuff like that, um, leverage the capabilities of Code Pipeline, right? So this is a product that is built on top of AWS services. Uh, and some of those services may include those primitive um, services that, that you may use or may have used. And here's one for Doug. Uh, this is a good question. So why didn't you choose to use the AWS console? Why is it a separate uh, URL? Yeah, so the, the idea behind it is that, so the vision is always bigger than what we have today, right? Hmm. So if you think about, like, if we think about where we want to go with this, um, one, we wanted to get developers. And if you think about the AWS console, it's all tied around AWS accounts and then IAM permissions on top of that. When really this product is for a developer. Um, a developer doesn't have an identity in an IAM context with an AWS account, right? Mm -hmm. And we also wanted to, to break it apart because um, we want, so the way this works today, in fact, one of the very first things that happened um, after we released in preview at reInvent was we had someone on Twitter uh, create a project and then in, they think they said 15 minutes, had that project deployed to three different regions, like just like that, right? Our product didn't have to be in those regions because it's, it's a global experience, right? It's regionless, mm -hmm. and that was the intent. Those are the two, I'd say, big reasons why we did that. Give you an identity, let you deploy it anywhere you want. Yeah. So obviously, at this point, we're really interested in getting people's feedback for it to see how they enjoy the product. And you mentioned there's that get feedback button. So when you try this out, make sure you use that. We do read all the feedback, actually. People wonder what happens to it, but people like Doug get all this feedback, and it really does go into the product development experience. Doug, tell us what happens to the feedback. Like really, yeah, what does I'll, happen? Yeah, 100%. So um, we actually ran a fairly large beta with this uh, product prior to releasing it, even in preview. Mm. And that feedback that we got throughout the beta very directly influenced what we did next. Um, so no joke, every time someone hits that give feedback button, it actually creates an entry for us in our backlog. I get an email for every single one of them. I read every single one of them that comes in. Um, as well do our other product managers uh, and some of our SDMs as well. So again, we very, very directly use that feedback to influence what we do next. So we'd, again, if you're doing it for a particular use case um, or you have you found something interesting or you found something you don't like, right? we want to hear all of it, right? So tell us things, things that work well for you, things that don't work, um, use cases that you have, all that kind of stuff. We'd love to hear it. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks very much to both of you for coming on and explaining how Code Catalyst works and Ryan for giving us the demo. That was really interesting. 
Uh, for the, everybody else watching, don't forget you've always got serverless land where we keep all the latest blogs, videos, patterns, and other developer content. You can always find that 24-7 at serverlessland.com. Julian will be back next Tuesday with another show, but otherwise, that's it from us. If you have any questions in the meantime, hit us up on Twitter, LinkedIn, and all the usual channels. Thanks very much for coming. Have a great week. See you.